Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first ever Book Break spoiler special for Greece Public Library. I am Kirstra. I'm one of the librarians here. I moderate the Pints and Prose Book Discussion Group and the Virtual Science Fiction and Fantasy Book Discussion Group. I'm joined, as always, by my colleague, Claire. Hello, everyone. I'm Claire, and I moderate the As the Page Turns and also our Historical Fiction Group. And today we have a special guest, our avid reader and director, Cassie Guthrie. Thanks, Claire. Um, yes, I was very excited to be asked to join two of the fabulous librarians at the Greece Public Library. Uh, as director, I don't get to do nearly as much fun stuff as they do, so thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. So today, um, those of you who are familiar with Book Break, we're doing something just a little bit different. So we're calling this a spoiler special and we are only talking about one book. Um, so we are talking about Wonderland. I think Claire, you have one of the hard copies. I actually have one with me. There we go. Wonderland by Zoya Stage. Um, Zoya was our first Grease Reads author. So in March, um, we all read Baby Teeth, which is her debut novel, and she Zoomed with us to talk about the book and her writing process and all kinds of things. Um, so her sophomore book, Wonderland, was released this summer, um, and we are going to talk all uh, about it. So this is a spoiler special. We are going to get into details. If you haven't read the book yet and you don't want to be spoiled, you might want to come back to this video after you get a chance to read the book. But if you've already read it or you don't mind finding out some details ahead of time, stick with us. We're going to have a great conversation about it. Um, so Claire, why don't you, I think you're the one who has finished the book most recently. <laughs> so it's probably a little yeah. fresh in your mind. Just this week, as a matter of fact. <laughs> there you go. So why don't you right. walk us through the basics of the plot? Okay, um, the one thing that intrigued me when she mentioned she was writing this book that it was set here in New York. So that kind of piqued my interest. Um, and it's a house in the Adirondacks, which I love the Adirondacks. So that also was interesting. We have five main characters. It's a family, the Bennett family. Um, Orla is the mom. She's a retired ballerina who has lived and danced in New York City. Um, Shaw is the stay at home dab and her father refers to him as a dabbler. Um, so he's kind of done a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but he's um, found a new calling and he wants to be a painter. So they're going to swap roles where Shaw be the one supporting the family and Orla will be supporting him. They have two children, Eleanor Queen, who is um, timid, introverted, anxious, but also very sensitive to things, um, incredibly perceptive, and takes in the world around her. Uh, and then there's younger brother Tycho, who is curious, easygoing, fun, um, and the young, you know, just the typical little boy, I would say. Um, the fifth main character is the forest, a huge tree that lies behind their new home. Um, that has ancient kind of magical powers that affect the weather and also becomes Shaw's artistic muse in their new home. So the story begins with uh, the family traveling to their new, which is an older home in the Adirondacks, to start their new life. Um, and suddenly there's a whiteout, you know, once they get there. The weather is very strange. They have unusual severe storms. They have northern light appearances, um, no cell phone coverage, which seems to be a standard in all horror <laughs> novels I'm noticing. <laughs> um, and then they find out that the, the land they are on was um, once a tuberculosis cure cottage. Um, so there may be some elements there with some people that have died. They might feel they're haunting them. Eleanor Queen becomes more and more attuned to this, as does Shaw. Orla is trying to figure out what in the name of God is going on with her family um, and wants to be the savior. So without further ado, uh, there is a mysterious appearance. Shaw ends up dead. The story focuses more to 
Orla and Eleanor Queen and how they're going to solve this. Tycho comes, goes from the story. Um, I don't want to give too much away, but yeah, yeah, that's basically where we are. Um, yeah. So, and one of the things too, that's like one of the major plot points is that a lot of these phenomena are, seem to be trying to keep the family in the cabin, right? Like they get mm -hmm. freaked out yeah. and Orla's like, we gotta go. And nature seems to be sort of conspiring to keep them there. Yeah. That's a really interesting point. And um, as Claire was kind of giving the outline of the story, for me, it was kind of split in two parts. So for the first part of the book, prior to the demise of Shaw, it was really um, about nature for me and that it was, it was strictly nature that was keeping them, you know, at this um, isolated farmhouse location. And then in the second half of the book, um, you know, we become aware that nature's really just the vehicle for something else that's keeping them at that, that farmhouse. So yeah. for me, the book was really kind of a hard split mm, interesting. trying to figure out what was going on. And, you know, at the start, it was all about nature. And then this new element came in about halfway through. So almost like two mysteries that sort of merged mm -hmm. into one combined mystery. Mm -hmm. You know what is odd is, and I, I didn't know when to talk about this, but I didn't find this scary at all. Like this hmm. is billed as a horror novel and I am probably the biggest Frady cat this side of <laughs> Texas and I just wasn't scared, you know. I found it more like a psychological thing and it's yes. interesting to me that um, for those of you that have read Baby Teeth, it's a very strong mother-daughter thing going on. Mm -hmm. This one as well. So, um, and it seems like the daughter is actually the more powerful character, which I find very mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I actually think that there's a lot of ways. So I flew through this book in like three days, um, like maybe three sittings, just tore through it. Um, and the thing that really struck me as I was reading it is how you can kind of read um, at least the first half, maybe not so much the second half, but you can kind of read it as like a, a commentary on motherhood and traditional roles. So when we start the book, Orla is the breadwinner. She's been a ballerina. She's been working and supporting the family. And then there's this whole conversation, Claire, that you alluded to where they decide it's Shaw's turn. <laughs> so he gets to sort of be in charge. He picks where they go. It's his turn to kind of pursue his own artistic passions. And the, when they move, Orla has no experience with rural living. Um, she feels totally out of her depth in just like how to get through a winter, um, not in a city. And she feels completely trapped. So I think there's that like emotional feeling of trapped and then it's sort of reflected in nature is really conspiring to like snow in the whole house and trap us in the house. So that's that's where my head was. That's a great point because I, I believe that Orla was originally from Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is yeah. where the author currently lives. Yes. Um, which I just recently visited. Uh, so <laughs> was sort of thinking about all this together. Uh, so, and, you know, being a professional ballerina, Orla left Pittsburgh, um, which is a fair sized city, fairly young to go to New York City to mm -hmm. study ballet. So, and, and um, Shaw, I think, is from Plattsburgh, which is where yeah. his brother, um, you mm -hmm. know, the differences between Plattsburgh and New York City, or even Pittsburgh. And in the novel, too, um, after Shaw has, has left everyone, died, mm -hmm. um, Orla sort of starts um, fantasizing about getting herself and the children to her parents' house in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of that familiar out of this completely, you know, even before all this stuff started happening, alien landscape to her right. as a city person. Yeah. I think I find myself, um, I have a lot of trouble with this genre because, and this is just me, the mom is I'm reading this when they're talking about Shaw, you know, support, and I'm like, okay, who's carrying the health insurance? What, <laughs> who's paying the bills, damn it, you know? I, I just, 
I just am just blown away. That you, that's just, you know, while we have some savings and this mm -hmm. and that, and I'm just like, like, See, that like where's your pediatrician? You know. <laughs> that's very funny. I, I guess maybe for me, I have actually um, a, a, a woman that I went to college with <laughs> and she studied dance. We went to a women's college. She's now out in Los Angeles and she um, teaches ballet to this day. And she also writes on the side. So I have a lot of friends who are kind of not in that, you know, you have a job that has health mm -hmm. insurance kind of thing. So that yeah. doesn't strike me, but it's interesting that you say that because I do have a little bit, you know, I have, I'm a mother as well. And I have sort of that mm -hmm. maternal, more with baby teeth. I had some really mm -hmm. strong reactions to that and some really strong connections that I felt with what the author was trying to tell us. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel that as much in this. But you're right. I mean, it's kind of, you know, when you've got a, a professional ballerina mother and a dabbler um, mm -hmm. husband who kind of go, you know, in the artistic realm, I think they also mentioned he was, um, didn't he like drive a taxi or an, like he had sort of these. Yeah, like, you know, he might have been a barista at one point, uh, yeah. guitar yeah. work, you know. Yeah, um, yeah he was that the one that worried me more so than yeah. Orla because she at least you know, I would imagine if you dance with a professional company that you would have some sort of, you know, I, I think it's personally my problem in suspension of belief. Claire wants her stack and blacken. Yeah. <laughs> Very practical. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying you're wrong. No, <laughs> you <know. no. laughs> yeah. Um, so let's talk about Shaw a little bit, the dabbler. So what did you think of that character? Did you like, I found myself getting very frustrated with him because he was like, oh, I'm the artist. And yeah. like locking himself in the, in the studio. Like I could see kind of both sides of it, but. I don't know if it was a, a, a female reaction. Um, so I, I did feel that uh, to a certain extent. But on the other hand, you know, the, the there, there's a good amount of background given um, from Orla about what it was like when she was the breadwinner. So, sure. you know, and how little she would see the rest of the family and how Shaw really picked up the slack once the children were born. So, um, and I'm not really sure for me if it, if it's, if it's solely that, or I think once I figured out what was really going on and why he was reacting the way that he was reacting some of the time, um, I was more sympathetic to him. Sure. But initially, yeah, I definitely did <laughs> feel a little bit of what you're describing. I loved his name, Shaw. What yeah. a great name. You know, so I was just like immediately predisposed to like him, I think, also <laughs> because it's just an interesting name that you don't hear very often. It's a, a first name. So mm -hmm. Yeah, lots of interesting names in this book. Yes, uh, Eleanor Queen. I guess I didn't quite understand that one. Did either one of you? So there was the bit where she's talking about Eleanor of Aquitaine. Mm -hmm. um, and there was like a painting in the museum, right? That she used to go and visit. Am I remembering that correctly? Uh, was, she that had some else. logical thing, but yeah. I, I just found it irritating after a while. <laughs> Eleanor Queen, Eleanor Queen, you know. And I think it was like, supposed to like give Eleanor Queen like strength, like give her strong queenly name? Because of her personality. So, and, and I do think that one of the things that Orla felt was um, a benefit of moving to the Adirondacks, you know, um, is, is how timid um, she perceived mm -hmm. Eleanor Queen to be in Manhattan you know, where there's just a million things going on and it's almost like sensory overload. And for an anxious child, I think that she felt, and maybe part of the reason that she was, you know, amenable to the whole idea of doing this is that it would give Eleanor Queen a more, um, I'm not sure what the right word is. Like manageable atmosphere. Manageable, mm -hmm. yeah. Environment that's more conducive to a child who's anxious about everything. There's mm -hmm. obviously not sirens going off all the time yeah. if you're in New York City. Um, you know, you're going to kind of be. Yeah, more space. They were all, I think, living in a one bedroom apartment. But then that flips at one point mm -hmm. once they get up there. And um, I think, or I think it's Orla who. Um, 
is talking about how she feels, even though they're in the same house, how separate they are because mm -hmm. the children have their own bedrooms mm -hmm. and they're able to be in the same house but not be in contact with each other, which wasn't yeah. the case when they lived in New York. Yeah, isolation. Everything's about isolation. Everything is about isolation. <laughs> Um, which speaking of isolation is interesting because you were Cassie just in both New York and Plattsburgh recently. Yes. And it's, um, you know, we're talking about the, the move that the family made for all of these reasons, uh, from New York city to the Adirondacks. And in August I was in Lake Placid mm -hmm. and also made a short trip to Plattsburgh. Uh, and what really struck me about being in the Adirondacks in the age of coronavirus is how incredibly busy Lake Placid was. <laughs> um, not with what you would typically see there, which would be Canadian license plates. Um, just, I, I felt like I was there and like all of New York State had descended upon the Adirondacks because it was August and everyone had been, you know, at home isolated since March. So it was, it was impossible to get, um, uh, restaurant reservation. I mean, mm. part of that was because the, but it was just a very um, different experience um, to be there. And then just last week, I was in New York City, which was fascinating. Um, it was so startling, especially in the tourist areas, how empty it was, how quiet it was. Um, you know, you would get into sort of the out of the tourist areas and into the residential and it was a little bit more like the New York that I'm used to, but not entirely. So it just kind of struck me that how coronavirus has changed. And I wonder, and I started thinking a little bit about this book and what would the settings have been like now? I think about that a lot too, like when I'm watching TV like new programs that are coming out. And I'm like, when are people going to start wearing masks on the television programs? Yeah, definitely. You no, know? And that was sort of entered into it to me as kind of an interesting um, way that what's happened in 2020 has changed just so many aspects of, of everything, including the books that we read, the movies that we watch. So. And how we watch the graphic comment and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Hmm. Well, I do think, uh, so I follow Zoya on Instagram and uh, she did just make a post about finishing a draft. So it seems she's hard at work on her next book. So we shall have to see how the age of coronavirus That's interesting. Uh, yeah. works into that, if at all. Um, but in regards to this one, so should we talk about uh, Shaw's death a little bit? Yes. Yeah. So Claire alluded to that in her um, summary. So let me see if I remember accurately <laughs> how this goes down. So they're trying to leave at this point, um, the whole family. Um, they're trying to pack up and hurry out because they're so freaked out about everything that's happening. Um, and uh, Shaw is trying to dig out the car and Orla goes inside to like gather more stuff or get the kids and comes out and sees a giant bear in the front yard. A and polar bear. Polar bear, that's right. Mm -hmm. Not even like a black bear. Nope. Polar bear. Polar bear. Polar bear. Um, and gets super freaked out and is worried that the bear is gonna harm Shaw or harm the kids and goes inside and gets a gun and comes back out and shoots the bear. And the bear is Shaw. <laughs> like she fires the gun and like takes another look and Shaw is bleeding out on the ground. Um, so I like those few pages, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> what's gonna happen? Um, were you guys surprised? Like, what was your reaction to that? Aside from like, oh, crap. <laughs> well, I wasn't surprised because I think by this time we know that something is trying to continue its life. And the mm -hmm. first target was Shaw. And he was trying to think of a way to get out of it. Like Just he fighting. knew what was happening. Mm. Uh, thought about suicide, like Orla had 
found him with a shotgun, like ready to kill himself. Um, so I think that the the thing was, you know, ready to get rid of him so she could find a new host, mm. you know, which she did find. So that was that was the end of Shaw. <laughs> I was Poor surprised. Guy. I guess for me, I didn't expect it to be Shaw. I was still kind of on the path of, um, you know, nature mm -hmm. was, you know, so the, the Northern Lights that one of you guys referenced, um, you know, they're standing there and they're looking at it, the family, the four of them. This is kind of early on when they first get to the house. And, you know, half of the reaction from Orla is, oh, wow, isn't that beautiful? But then she's got Shaw saying to her, this isn't supposed to happen here. This isn't right. something that happens in this part of the world. So she's sort of torn between that, oh, isn't this beautiful? And the wrongness of the situation. Mm -hmm. So to me, that was, again, you know, nature, you know, coming at them. Then the, um, the trees moving towards the house. Mm -hmm. The, I can't remember what they call it. She, uh, hay bales of snow. Um, mm -hmm. There was yeah. a, there was a, a, it's actually a phenomenon that they were talking about in the book. And all of these things, I was just, um, like the polar bear, I didn't think it was Shaw. I think it came from, I, was, I thought it was coming for Shaw, that it was just Got another it. one of these, like, why would you, if it had been a black bear, I might have thought differently, but a polar bear in the Adirondack Mountains? No, it's wrong, like all of the other nature mm -hmm. things were wrong. So I didn't think it was Shaw yeah. initially. Well, and that's an interesting point, too, because um, one of the things with the, the nature, like the terrifying nature is that there's also the beautiful nature on the other side, like, and for a long time, Orla can't figure out, and we as readers, I think, can't figure out whether what's happening is good or bad, and I think that plays into the nature, too, because nature is, like, bigger than good or bad, right? Like, the snowstorm doesn't care. Nature is just nature. Buried. Right, nature is just nature. So some of the things are like beautiful and wonderful and some of them are wonderful and terrible. Um, and you don't really, you, it's hard to figure out where it's gonna kind of shake out. There was one thing that's along um, this these lines that I didn't understand. So maybe I'll ask the two of you if you understood it. The half rabbit, half yeah, fox mm. or whatever it was. Well, I think it was a fox. Let's call it yeah. half rabbit, half fox. That Orla, right. you know, so that's that's an abomination of nature, right? Mm -hmm. That's not just being like the yeah. northern lights where they shouldn't be or a polar bear where it doesn't belong. Mm -hmm. This is something that wouldn't belong anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I didn't quite understand if that was related to what ends up being called the girl mm -hmm. or the being that is trying to leave its current home in nature mm -hmm. and go to another home in nature. Mm. It just seemed like this thing that just kind of happened that I didn't quite yeah. connect with other things. I guess looking back, I can maybe, so one of the other things about the nature is um, at some point Orla starts to suspect that what the phenomena are sort of feeding on the family's thoughts and desires like Tycho wants snow as high as the roof and then overnight it snows as high as the roof right um so just looking back on that I kind of connect the abomination to Shaw's paintings um which are kind of um eerie and they do relate more to the tree and what we find out about the tree but it's like kind of these hybrid trying to express something. figures in the painting. Maybe I don't. I don't know because that's so, what the paintings are, right? They're kind right. of hybrids of yeah, of tree and person. I don't know, or maybe it's icky. just that was the ickiest part of the book for me. Yeah, like that. That was not scary, but just like ew. unsettling. <laughs> yeah, very unsettling. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the tree and the girl. <laughs> so Claire, do you want to run through what we, what we discover about the tree? Well, there's a girl that's been living in the tree. Like, can I back us up for a minute? Cause I of think, course. 
so early on in the novel, when they're looking at properties, so when Shaw and Orla are looking for properties, and they come across the one they end up buying, and it has this huge tree in the backyard, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's some, there's, you know, we, we learn through Orla that, you know, the house, they'd seen nicer houses, but that there was something about this one and the tree that attracted them. Mm -hmm. So the tree from the very beginning is kind of yeah. this focal point and that, that Shaw and Orla don't quite understand why they're so attracted to this particular piece of property, but we're given like little hints and little clues that it's about the tree that Claire is now going to talk about. Mm -hmm. Well, that Shaw says he thinks it's his muse. Um, exactly. it, it begins to appear in his artwork, like even mm -hmm. when he's doing a New York skyline, the tree is behind it. And oh. yeah. Um, so when he's doing that, he also makes a discovery of a chimney. And that's when he discovers, like in an old book, that um, it was this TB before a big sanatorium that was a cottage. And then he starts envisioning that people have died on the property. And that's eventually how they lead into this girl who probably died there that went to live in the tree and now wants to live in something more lively, like Eleanor Queen, you know? Well, I think the tree is dying. Yes. yes. So I think yes. that, that is why, that is why the girl needs to get mm -hmm. out of the tree and why she called mm -hmm. Tycho, when, uh, not Tycho, um, Shaw, when Shaw. they came to the house, right. she must mm -hmm. have, maybe that's how, like she was trying with the rabbit and tr or the fox. I don't yeah, maybe. So I actually, when I was um, prepping for this talk, I read the book. Um, I purchased it while we were still on quarantine. I pre-ordered it and I read it back in like June, I think. So it's been a little while. So I was flipping through and prep for this and there's a little, um, a little bit, I can't remember what it's called. I'm losing all of my words before the main book starts. That is actually if you look back on it from the point of view of the girl in the tree and it's about how she it realizes that it's dying and Very it's got to do something yes please so um it's not a preface it's just whatever you call that i can't remember yeah. either. that thing that yeah is before the first chapter right there were no words words no longer existed time and consciousness were fluid abstract but there was an awareness and with it, an urgency, death, death, death like a drumbeat calling from the past. It had a familiar scent, death, as if she had encountered it before. You're absolutely right. So you read this right at the beginning mm -hmm. and it doesn't mean anything to you, but it's all about end, it. Yeah, at the end, yeah. it, has, it has real yeah. meaning. Yeah. Um, and I think so when Shaw finds out about the girl, there's a picture of her in front of this TV cottage and she's wearing a pentagram necklace. So I think we're supposed to believe that there's some kind of paganism oh, yeah, yeah. involved. Um, and Orla and Eleanor Queen kind of concoct this vaguely pagan ritual to try and appease the spirit in the tree and like send her on into the beyond. Uh, which does not work. <laughs> it's like a going away party. Yeah. No. <laughs> Thanks. She's not having it. <laughs> yeah, she's not having it. That's for sure. No. Um, but the thing that I thought was interesting too is that so Eleanor Queen again is very sensitive and has started picking up on some of this stuff that's going on psychically or however. Um, and this is sort of how Eleanor Queen like finds herself and finds her voice and her confidence is that she starts becoming to her mother an advocate for this girl. Like we have to save her. She's dying. We have to, I can help. Let me do it. And Orla is sort of confronted with like, I wanted my kid to like find herself and her voice and her confidence, but I don't like where this is heading. Um, which I thought, you know, as a parent also was like, well, yeah, that's kind of how 
parenting goes. Like we want our kids to be people and then they start being their own people. And we're like, wait, not like that though. <laughs> not that person. <laughs> There's another element that enters into what you just said, Kirster, was um, if we're done with what we were talking about, we, well, the girl in the tree from this point on kind of mm -hmm. enters into everything. Yeah. But um, Orla loses Tycho. Mm-hmm. And Eleanor Queen um, says to her mother, you know, I think I can help. I think that we might be able to get Tycho back if you let me do this. So uh, Orla's really, and um, there were a couple of things in, in this book that reminded me of other books. And this particular aspect of um, what Orla as a mother was confronted with. Uh, so Tycho... They're, this is another attempt to leave. This is after Shah has, mm -hmm. has died. And Orla and uh, Tycho and Eleanor Queen are walking up the driveway. There's snow everywhere. There's a blizzard. Uh, they think that if maybe if they can just get to the road, they'll be okay. If they can just get far enough away from the tree, they'll be okay. It actually turns out to be the opposite, and they find themselves on floating ice flows as if they're in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. Um, so Eleanor Queen and Orla end up falling off and Tycho doesn't and they wake up the next morning in the house soaking wet Orla and Eleanor Queen and Tycho's nowhere to be found. So well, we what's happened to Tycho. Right, well Eleanor Queen falls and Orla has to decide yes. whether yes. to try to what to do Tycho. to stay with Tycho or to go after Eleanor Queen. Yeah, there's, so actually there's two times in this book that she has mm -hmm. the choice to make. Mm -hmm. I had completely forgotten yeah. that. So then after Tycho is lost for a time, um, and the tree, the girl in the tree is communicating more with Eleanor Queen, this Eleanor Queen goes to her mother and says, I think I know a way that if we help her and, we, and I let her in, that we can get Tycho back. So the book that I'm thinking of, of course, is Sophie's Choice um, mm -hmm. by Richard Styron, which came out in 1979. And then there was the movie that came out in the 80s mm -hmm. with Meryl Streep, where uh, Meryl Streep plays a woman who was sent to Auschwitz during World War II and was given the choice with her two children of uh, one of them is going to the gas chamber and the other one is going to the labor camp. Which one do you choose? Which is, of course, an impossible choice right. that she is forced to make. And I, I kept thinking that Orla is kind of in this book. Well, it's, it's a little less cut and dry than in Sophie's sure. Choice. But, you know, do I take this chance that I might save my son if I allow this spirit who, quite frankly, terrifies me to inhabit mm -hmm. my daughter? Mm hmm yes yeah. i mean there's some you know there's some interesting stuff in there there was a lot going on for me mm -hmm. in reading this book yeah so in the end um orla decides that she's going to that the best chance for everyone to sort of survive is to let eleanor queen take in this the spirit the consciousness of this girl um and manages to convince herself like it'll actually give Eleanor Queen this amazing new opportunity to have all of these powers and like control the weather <laughs> and whatnot. She'll have a bigger life. Um, she can help with global warming, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, that actually was brought up, wasn't it? It was. Um, like, what can she That, was, that was a thought. Like, she can help the whole world now. Um, so they end up staying the three of them in the cabin and Eleanor Queen is now um, her own hybrid with the girl and um, at the very end Eleanor Queen is like playing with the weather and playing with storms and there's a lightning strike on the car and Orla has this moment of like did I what it what did I do like, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, as you said before, I mean, Eleanor Queen was really advocating for this. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, you know, in some ways for, for Eleanor Queen, that was her coming into herself. Like she was really actually able to convince her mother that this was the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, so you sort of see Eleanor Queen kind of grow through that, that whole process of, of advocating for the spirit in the tree to be allowed to have it inhabit her body. <laughs> It sounds weirder than it does when you read the book, but. <laughs> yeah. 
which I think is actually one of the author's talents is um, her, I just really like her prose, the way she tells the story. It, she has a very um, clear style, like there's not a lot of fussiness or adornment and just the way she presents everything, you're just like walking along with her and you're like, wait, what? <laughs> Did I, like hybrid rabbit fox creature? <laughs> like girl is now also pagan spirit? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. But like, All right. keeps did anybody up. else wonder like, where were the truant officers? Where was, I, I kept picturing Shaw's dead body laying on the front lawn and having Under a tarp. people drive by. It they put no a tarp over it. There's a blue tarp over it. Yeah, there's a blue yeah, tarp. Well, I don't know. It's cold out there. It's not like it was going to go bad or anything. Um. <laughs> this is why Claire doesn't do horror, you know? Well, you know, I, I think, you know, as far as, so once the satellite dish, it, so, so part of it is, right, they have terrible service out there, but then mm -hmm. they get a satellite dish. Is that, was that what it was? They were waiting for somebody to yeah. call something. Yep. And then I think somehow the weather destroyed their ability to communicate with Shaw's um, brother in Plattsburgh. So there was some talk about eventually someone is going to come, you know, eventually, um, you know, Shaw's brother's going to figure out that they haven't heard, or they were on vacation, I think. He'll be back mm -hmm. from vacation. They haven't heard from, from Shaw. Um, but I think also, you know, again, having just driven through the Adirondacks to get from Rochester to Lake Placid in August, there, you know, and it's funny because you're, you know, I, I will always be driving in the summertime, but the, you'll see signs everywhere as you drive through the Adirondacks, you know, school bus turn around ahead. And you think about like how isolated it is up there in the wintertime and you know they had just moved there and i think they were homeschooling weren't they Tycho yeah, I think was, so. yeah. Tycho was too young for school and they were going to give um eleanor queen the second half you know it was like mm -hmm. mid year that they left new york city that the, she was going to be homeschooled and then they would make a new decision the following yeah. year so i guess for me it didn't really there were explanations given for why somebody wasn't showing up. And yeah. then she also at one point mentions how little mail we all get today. So it's not like yeah. even the mail person would see, you know, a box filled up with stuff and think, oh, something's wrong. Because of the age that we live in, there's so much email. Yeah. Big blue tarp in the front yard. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a side yard. Like the yeah. garage, it was like kind of yeah. like dragged them behind the garage a little bit to um, cover them up. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other points <laughs> that y'all want to hit? <laughs> Anything else you need to uh, need to bring practicality to Claire? No, no, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I do like the way she writes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I really do. I, I think her prose and everything is beautiful. Um, I just, I think I have a personal suspension of belief issue that affects how I enjoy novels like sure. this. Well, it but, is not um, your genre, to be fair. Like this yeah, is not your preferred yeah. reading experience. Um, oh, I, the last thing I wanted to, to say was, will one of you hold up the cover again? Because after finishing the book, looking at the cover art, um, it's oh, so well, beautiful. Like the woman made out of mm -hmm. the tree roots. Tree. Yeah. I just yeah. thought it was super cool. Um, I, so I, I enjoyed this, but I will say that um, I enjoyed Baby Teeth more, I think. Okay. Um, I am a horror reader. I don't know that, you know, reading, you know, horror movies scare me. Mm -hmm. um, reading horror, I don't know that scare is the right word. Um, it's more um, unsettling. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say that word. Um, so this book did unsettle me. I guess for me, um, I found in a way that I didn't in Baby Teeth, and I can't remember the mother, father, daughter's name in Baby Teeth, but for me, um, the mother in Baby Teeth was um, a truer character to me. Orla mm -hmm. kind of bugged me okay. after a while. Um, and I can't really put my finger on it, what it was about her. Um, 
I'm just going to say this and it may not make any sense. It just seemed like throughout the book, she was just always running around from place to place in sort of a not, I don't know if it's, um, you know, Claire is a, is a practical person. I'm a person She's who likes to fluttery. Kind of like, fluttery. Like I want to know, okay, so we've tried this. And again, this is mm -hmm. probably just my personality. <laughs> All right, Orly, you tried that. So what's your next step? And instead it just seemed like she was running around willy nilly, as my mm -hmm. father would have said, um, from thing to thing and not coming up with a really concrete plan, which is probably a little bit unfair because <laughs> of what was happening around her. I can't imagine that I would have really reacted in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. I just, I had trouble with her a little bit. I think I definitely understand where you're coming from with that. I think for me, um, the thing that mitigated that was just the sense that she was completely out of her depth in like the whole thing. Like she, she didn't know for the longest time, like what was normal and what was not normal. So she was like, do I freak out about this? Oh, wait, that's a thing that just happens. Okay, never mind. Or maybe that's a thing that just happens. Oh, wait, I should freak out about that. Like, so I think she was just off balance the entire time. And then, you know, they lost, she lost the internet very quickly mm -hmm. after getting it. So it's not like she could go and, you know, once Shaw was gone, it's not like she could go and, and figure out from another source whether some of these nature things that were happening mm -hmm. were normal or not. So that's yeah. a good point. So she had like the family stress and then the nature stress and like not knowing what to expect. And then she kills her husband by accident. <laughs> she killed the polar bear. It just happened to be her yeah, husband. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a small distinction. <laughs> yeah. Fair point. <laughs> yeah, no, but I'm, I'm glad to hear she's working on something new. That's exciting. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I guess last roundup, would you recommend this book to someone else? Oh, lots of hard thinking. Oh, I was going to let Claire go first. Oh, um, oh. <laughs> but I can go first. Um, you I, go first. let me just talk about, uh, baby teeth again for a minute. So mm -hmm. I first became aware of baby teeth because I was at the public library association conference in Philadelphia. 2018? 18. Mm -hmm. So um, when you go to conferences for librarians, the publishers are all there and they have what are called um, ARCs, advanced reader copies, because they know that um, if they can get librarians excited about a book, they're going to do well with sales. Yeah. So I had somehow heard that this author was, had worked at one of the branches of the Rochester Public Library at one point. Yep. And I loved the title, Baby Teeth. I was completely intrigued by what that could possibly mean. And the cover at the time on the advanced reader copy was that lollipop mm -hmm. that was kind of shattered. Mm -hmm. the sort of this like really innocent um, image of childhood that looked like it had been hit with a sledgehammer. So I picked it up. Then I discovered that she um, had lived in Rochester for a time. And I just loved that book. So here's what I would say about Wonderland. I would recommend it, but I would recommend Baby Teeth before I would recommend Wonderland. I, I, I liked Wonderland. I think there was some really good stuff there. And having this conversation with uh, the two of you has made me think about it again in a way that it might actually need a rereading. Uh, so I would recommend it. But for this author, I would go with book number one first. Fair enough. Yeah, I kind of feel the same. I felt like Baby Teeth was a more interesting effort to me, maybe because mm -hmm. it was more psych psychological. Um, mm -hmm. I definitely feel like some of the same elements were in this book. I would have thought that the nature and the setting of, of Wonderland would have appealed to me more. Mm -hmm. um, but for some reason, it just left me a little flat. So not a bad read, uh, an interesting read. I got, you know, got through it, but I don't, it was definitely not my not my jam, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I probably just flat out liked this book the most of the three of us. Um, but I think, and it's definitely a very different book to Baby Teeth. And I've been saying that to anyone who asked me about it. Like, if you liked Baby Teeth, like I would recommend you read Wonderland, but don't expect 
the same experience. It's a very mm -hmm. different yeah, reading that's experience. That's a good way to put it, yeah. Um, but I also, I don't know if it was reading it like coming off of quarantine, but the like isolation all the time and like stresses of family life and parenthood and isolation really spoke to me at that point. So I think I had a connection to it there um, that uh, made it stand out a little more for me. Mm -hmm. Well, you read it in June. Yeah, I think so. I read it in September. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. I mean, that yeah. may be um, part of it, you know, because the further we get into this, the, the, the less I find myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, 2020 has been quite a year, right? Um, so yeah. like the further we get into it, the less I necessarily want to relate to something that's similar to the experience that I've been having in 2020. Sure. <laughs> but I felt differently in June, you know, May and June, mm -hmm. I think I, if had I read it in May or June, I might have had a different take on it. So that's interesting. Yeah. So. All right, so thank you both for joining us for this first spoiler special. Um, we will be back with a regular book break soon talking about horror novels. Um, but if you would like to see another spoiler special, let us know in the comments on Facebook or YouTube about what you would like us to cover and talk about. And if you have read Wonderland, tell us what you thought. We would love to hear from all of you um, and hear more about your opinions about Wonderland. So Cassie and Claire, thank you so much for joining us. And we will see you. Thank next you. Time. Thanks for the invitation. Bye. Bye. Bye.